Hi guys, this presentation is on antibiotic resistance and MRSA meningitis. So MRSA meningitis is methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus meningitis. It's really rare. Um, it occurs between one to 9% of all bacterial meningitises, and it occurs spontaneously, which means there's no known cause, or nosocomially, which means that it occurs in the hospital environment with the presence of other sicknesses. Antibiotic resistance um, and its relationship to MRSA meningitis. So basically, MRSA meningitis is multidrug resistant, which means that it is resistant to three or more antibiotics. This um, reduces the effect of said antibiotic, and then that makes bacteria more powerful because it can multiply and it will not be stopped. Um, this can, you know, deem a disease as untreatable because there are a lack of options because it is resistant to antibiotics. Um, demographics and preventative measures. Um, MRSA meningitis occurs in places with high numbers of diabetes, drug use, uh, alcoholism, and HIV. It can be prevented through um, several vaccines, such as the meningococcal conjugate vaccine, the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, and two more. Um, and it can also be prevented via basic hygiene, such as washing your hands, covering your mouth when you cough, being mindful of what you eat, and exercising. And some common symptoms are fever, really bad rashes with a lot of pus that are really painful, um, very warm skin, altered consciousness, and general confusion. So the epidemiological differences between MRSA and MSSA, which is methicillin susceptible, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Meningitis um, differs in the rate in the rate of infection, the severity of meningitis, as well as any underlying conditions or diseases. The mortality rate for MSSA is around 20%, whereas around 28% uh, for MRSA. And 4 to 5% of um, MSSA becomes MRSA. So 25 to 40% of all people are asymptomatic carriers of the S of colonized S aureus. Um, and before the 2000s, MSSA was relatively common as it was funded and researched quite heavily. Where, however, in the 2000s, there was a emergence of new strands of S aureus, including community um, associated MRSA strand USA 300, and that was the most predominant strand by 2011. Um, this late um, emergence of MRSA led to a lack of funding compared to MSSA, as well as lack of treatments and treatment options available. Um, as well as in 2018, there was a study involving 273 orthopedic arthroplasty surgery outpatients, um, and they were all swabbed nasally for S. aureus, and in that, 75% of people were found to have micro, monomicromial infections, and of that, 30 to 38% were MSSA, and of that, 4 to 5% of patients developed MRSA. This shows a gross underestimation of the current known prevalence, which is 0.05, um, and this lack of knowledge also creates a lack of funding and research towards new therapies and anti antibiotics. Um, and this comes from a lack of direct actually swabbing. So we need to focus more on doing that to gain proper estimations of how prevalent it is in communities. The leading treatment option for MRSA is vancomycin, yet little is known about its safety and efficacy when used in critically ill patients. So in general terms, vancomycin, or VCM for short, is a glycopeptide antibiotic that impedes bacterial growth by inhibiting cell wall biosynthesis, thus triggering apoptosis. It is administered intravascularly on a weight-based dose. Nevertheless, recent studies have suggested that this method of administration might be improved by introducing a more definitive first dose administration, which will eventually increase clinical success. On another note, intravascular
Intravascular VCM administration seems to be correlated with renal impairments since 80 to 90% of the antibiotic is metabolized by the kidneys. Meanwhile, a single study found that the antibiotic could be restrained within the CSF through intracerebral ventricular administration, thus reducing nephrotoxicity associated with VCM. Further research into this new method is encouraged. And also, uh, new forms of the RS bacterium have emerged, including vancomycin intermediate resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or VISA, which was first discovered in the 1990s, and vancomycin resistant S aureus, or VRSA, for is reported in 2002. These two strands seem to suggest that VCM usage might be inefficient as a future MRSA treatment. For these reasons, VCM could potentially be used in combination therapy. So the known source of resistance in the bacteria is a specific gene called the MEK-A gene. What this gene does is it translates for a very specific penicillin binding protein called PB2A. So in normal um, Staphylococcus aureus, there are four penicillin binding proteins um, and PB2A is only found in bacteria that is resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. So what the penicillin binding proteins do is they form the bacteria cell wall. So they act as transpeptidase enzymes. So here's an image um, of a transpeptidase linking the two peptide stems within the cell wall. And this is what allows the bacteria to continue to produce its cell wall and it's very essential for bacteria survival. So this is why many beta-lactam antibiotics will target the penicillin binding proteins. So under normal circumstances, the beta-lactam antibiotics can bind to the PBP active site. And this is because they have a very similar molecular structure to the actual substrate that enters the PBP. So as you can see here, the uh, structure between penicillin and the two other beta-lactam antibiotics are quite similar to this uh, peptide fragment. So under nor normal circumstances, the beta-lactam antibiotics bind to the active site and they form a very stable complex due to um, a acylation reaction that is essentially irreversible. So the reason that beta-lactam antibiotics cannot disable PB2A is because the active site exists in this um, closed formation um, very deep within the actual protein. So the beta-lactam antibiotics cannot access the PB2A active site. So there's been a lot of research that has attempted to find a way around this. Um, one study found that there's actually an allosteric site located on PB2A and that uh, ceftaroline, a beta-lactam antibiotic, was able to bind to the allosteric site and then that would open up the active site for the other antibiotics. Um, despite the potential that this showed, there have been several mutations that have been found um, around the allosteric site that prevent ceftaroline from actually binding. Um, in 2014, a new class of non-beta-lactam antibiotics that disable PB2A were discovered. Um, but then again, there were 31 new mutations of the bacterial MMPL and TRX genes that were found. And little is actually known about the function of these genes in Staphylococcus aureus. So it would be very hard to understand and um, to prevent. Most recently, there were two synthetic retinoids that were discovered. Um, they had the ability to penetrate the cell membrane of the bacteria, um, but mutations in three genes were found. Uh, these genes translate for cell membrane proteins. And this caused many of the cells in the study to display moderate levels of resistance. So this doesn't rule out that there could potentially be widespread resistance later on to the synthetic retinoids. Furthermore, synthetic retinoids have a high level of toxicity to our own cell membranes um, in our cells, so this has been very controversial. So what's next? Um, as a group, we uh, determined that there should be a new antibiotic developed that actually targets the transcription of the MEK-A gene in the nucleus to entirely prevent PB2A from ever existing in the first place. And this would solve a lot of problems with resistance. So as a group, we wanna propose using combination therapy, 
What combination therapy is, is using two or more drugs to treat a disease such as MRSA. What combination therapy does is reduce the resistance to the development of a disease. So current research that we can see, as you can see, in the chart is the effect of therapy. So we have MAB, vancomycin, MAB plus vancomycin. The one with the lower CFU is MAB plus vancomycin. And the other monotherapies have a much higher CFU. And what the CFU is, the, is a measure of the viable bacteria. So as you can see, the combination therapy has a much lower CFU, and that means that combination therapy is a viable option. So our combination therapy would have an antibiotic, ceftarolin, and vancomycin. The antibiotic would target the MECA gene. The ceftarolin would alter the PB to a protein shape, and vancomycin would inhibit the cell wall growth. So um, in conclusion, uh, we decided that there should be a new antibiotic developed that targets the MECA gene specifically, and that this uh, antibiotic should be given in combination with uh, vancomycin or ceftaroline um, in the case that some spontaneous mutation would allow the MECA gene to be um, transcripted despite the antibiotic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you.